Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to talk about three athletes from three different decades, and they were all-stars, all-memorable names. Start out by saying it's been a tough time for the black and gold of Pittsburgh recently. The Steelers aren't doing too well. We did Jack Butler, one of their great players from the 50s, a couple of months back. And tonight we have to talk about Elsie Greenwood, who died at the age of 67. Elsie Green was the left defensive end on the Steel Curtain in the 1970s, one of the greatest defensive ends in NFL history. If you go back and look at the great front fours, you're probably only talking about three. Fearsome foursome of the Rams that had Deacon Jones on it, who we did recently. The Purple People Eaters of the early 70s, the Minnesota Vikings. The Pittsburgh Steel Curtain, of which Elsie Greenwood was a member and contributed to four Super Bowls. Here's a little bit of the NFL on the 1974 Steel Curtain. Though Chuck Noll was concerned over his sleeping giant offense, one thing that never let him down was the magnificent Steel Curtain defense. The strength of the Steel of defense is the front four. Number 68, L.C. Greenwood. Number 75, Joe Green. Number 63, Ernie Holmes. And number 78, Dwight White. Mad Dog, Mean Joe, Fats, Hollywood Bag. Arrowhead Ernie pointed the way to the pass pocket, and no matter what you called them or in what order you named them, the Steeler front four just kept coming. Now that group won four Super Bowls, and L.C. Green was a monster. He sacked Roger Staubach from the Cowboys four times in one of the Super Bowls. He knocked down two passes by Fran Tarkenton in a critical victory in another Super Bowl. He was the left defensive end opposite Mean Joe Green on the right. Mean Joe Green was probably the better player, but not by that much. You notice in that clip they mentioned Hollywood Bags. That was L.C. Greenwood's nickname because he always had his bags packed to go to Hollywood. He was a good-looking guy, very personable, good on camera. And so the other thing he was famous for were his Miller Lite commercials and his letters to quarterbacks. Here's one of them. I crushed a lot of quarterbacks in my day, and I'm real sorry. So I wrote this letter. <clears throat> Dear quarterback, I apologize for the way I treated you. <laughs> Please let me buy you a light beer from Miller. Like my beer because it tastes great. I'm sure it's yours too, because you little guys can't afford to get filled up. <laughs> See you soon. Sincerely, L.C. Greenwood. <laughs> light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer. Less. At the end of the commercial, he crushes a beer can. It's really impressive. There was a follow-up commercial by a quarterback from the Colts named Burt Jones. Good-looking guy, and he used to joke with L.C. Greenwood. So he wrote a follow-up letter on another Miller commercial, and unfortunately, he couldn't crush his beer can. I hear that L.C. Greenwood has invited quarterback to join him for a light beer from Miller. Well, here's my reply. Dear L.C., I accept your gracious offer. A quarterback is far too intelligent to turn down a light beer because it's less filling and it tastes great. Even you big clumsy linemen know that. Hope to see you soon. Sincerely, Bert Jones. Come on, Bert! Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. How'd you do that? Yeah, L.C. Old number 68. He was definitely the scourge of quarterbacks. Great player. He should be in the NFL Pro Football Hall of Fame. He's not. He got to the finals a couple of times. I think the main reason he's not is because he's been overlooked a couple of times because Joe Green played on the other end. But believe me, L.C. Green would definitely deserves it. He was as good as any left defensive end ever. He is a part of the Steelers' 75th silver anniversary team, and that's almost as big an honor. This gentleman probably still causes nightmares for quarterbacks of the 70s. Would you Okay, thank you very much. It's great being here tonight. Uh, it's actually great being anywhere. Uh, I, just, you know, I just want to thank all of you all that voted for not only myself, but for all the guys that are on the all time team. It's, it's a great honor just uh, to be honored and to be part of this uh, 75th anniversary. L.C. Green would like to see him get in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We're going to move on now to Bob Curland, who died at the age of 88. He had a tremendous career at Oklahoma A&M, which became Oklahoma State, and he was the first great big man in American basketball. He had a tremendous college career, and he had a tremendous Olympic career. In playing for the legendary coach Hank Iba, he revolutionized the game. IBM called him one of the 25 greatest players in basketball history. He's rated number 20. 25 greatest players ever. Number 20, Bob Curlin. 
three-time All-American, two-time NCAA Tournament Most Outstanding Player, two national championships, and one dunk. In 1946, the seven-foot Bob Curlin was the first player to dunk in a game. Well, he was the first player to dunk in a game, but he wasn't quite seven feet. Although he's reported seven feet, he actually stood about six foot ten. Oklahoma A&M won the national championships in 1945 and 1946 back to back. Here's the Oklahoma State Athletic Department description of those two championships and Bob Curlin's key role. Bob Curlin was one of the first true big men in college basketball. Curlin played for Henry Iba and helped bring back-to-back -back NCAA national championships back to Stillwater in 1945 and in 46. Curlin was a three-time All-American and helped change the face of college basketball as the seven-footer was responsible for the addition of the goaltending rule. He was Oklahoma State's all-time leading scorer for 46 years until Bryant Reeves and Byron Houston edged past him during the last five seasons. He now ranks third on that list. He still holds Oklahoma State records for points in a game with 58 versus St. Louis University back in 1946. He is OSU's only three-time All-American and two-time NCAA Tournament Most Valuable Player. During his four years at Oklahoma State, the Cowboys were 99-22, and 22, won the Missouri Valley Conference Championship in 1946, and two NCAA championships in 1945 and in 1946. He played on two Olympic teams in 1948 and again in 1952. Bob Curlin, a charter member of Oklahoma State University's Hall of Honor. Oklahoma A&M's first appearance in the NCAA tournament proved to be a successful one as the Aggies won the national title, defeating Utah and Arkansas en route to the title game. In the title game, Oklahoma A&M defeated New York University in New York 49-45. Mr. Iba's team was led by Bob Curlin's 22-point performance, which earned him most outstanding player honors. The 1946 Aggies produced the best record in school history, going 31-2 and, and making Oklahoma A&M the first school to win back-to-back -back national championships in NCAA basketball history. One of the most amazing feats was the fact that all five starters were named to the Missouri Valley Conference first team. The Aggies defeated North Carolina in the championship game 43-40. Once again, the Aggies were led by Bob Curlin's 23 points, which earned him the Most Outstanding Player Award for the second straight season. And he also won two gold medals in 1948 and 1952, and here he talks about how different basketball and the Olympic selection was in those days. It's a good perspective. It was a time of transition and a development of a, a whole different approach and uh, attitude toward uh, amateur basketball, which was disappearing and the pros were finally got in their arenas and got people with money to back up these, these players with uh, and make it attractive. Basketball and between the end of the war and that Olympics was the uh, kind of a nebulous thing because we were in the process of building new arenas and, and establishing the money machines in order to do what they do today in, in pro basketball. In those days, uh, you had a playoff series between colleges and they were semi-pro. So I, I went to work for Coles Petroleum Company when I got out of school. In 1948, the manner in which the team was chosen to go to London was that the amateur teams were still holding forth presenting people who could play the game and were really interested in the sport. It, the, the pros had really not established a basis of recognition and organization. In 1948, we had to earn $50,000. The team that we put together made up of Coast Petroleum Company and University of Kentucky and to, to even make the trip. Basketball in 1948 in the Olympics was not a very powerful thing. By the time we got around to 19. 52, I was still playing for Phil's Petroleum Company, and when we got down to the finals of the playoff tournament, why we got second place, and a guy named Wayne Glasgow and myself were chosen from the Phillips team, and we went to, Hel to Helsinki. It was a time of transition and an opportunity for those guys who were not playing for money. Bob Curlin, he never played pro, but he was one of the greatest. We're going to close tonight with James Street, the University of Texas quarterback in the late 1960s who never lost a game as a starter and was the quarterback in the famous 1969 Texas-Arkansas game. Here's Longhorn Network on James Street. Texas has produced better passers and better runners, but James Street remains the greatest winner in Texas history. The fact he even got on the field for Texas football is a testament to one of his greatest traits. 
his competitive fire. He arrived from Longview, Texas, in his words, as the 14th string quarterback. But going into his junior season in 1968, Coach Royal was looking for a spark following three straight four-loss seasons. When the newly installed wishbone offense struggled to find its spark, Royal brought Street off the bench in the second game. There was no way to predict what would follow. Coach Royal grabbed James Street, looked at him, thought about something really impressive to say as he was going to put him into the fray, and he looked at him and he said, hell, you can't do any worse, and he pushed him onto the field. James Street carved a legacy that probably is unmatched in Texas history. He became the first wishbone quarterback in 1968. He was the operator who made the wishbone work. It fit my style of play. Basically, I was quick, wasn't necessarily really fast, but gave us time to read what that linebacker or what that tackle was doing. Whatever they did, they did the wrong thing. With Street at quarterback, Texas ran the table, finishing the 1968 season with nine straight wins, including a blowout against Tennessee and the Cotton Bowl. But James didn't cement his legacy until the following season. In 1969, James Street didn't simply lead Texas to victory. He's still taller than his 5'11 frame when the Longhorns were most vulnerable. Like when Oklahoma opened a 14-0 lead in Dallas, it was Street that hit Cotton Spire to spark a 27-3 run to win the game. In the game of the century, Texas entered the fourth quarter trailing second-ranked Arkansas 14-0. Street started the quarter with a 42-yard touchdown run and then scored the two-point conversion. And when Texas faced a fourth and three in their own territory trailing late, Street delivered perhaps the most iconic play of the 1960s. Almost crucial fourth down play again for the Longhorns at their own 43 and a half. Going to go to Randy Peschel, and Peschel catches the ball! He thought we had to have a big play in that situation, so he called right 53 beer pass. I start onto the field, and I'm thinking right is that Cotton Spire is going to the right side of the field, and we're going to throw deep to one receiver going out, and that's Randy Peschel. I want to make sure that that's the formation he wants. Right 53 beer pass, Coach. Are you sure that's the play we want? Right 53 beer pass set up the game-winning score, put Texas back on top, and straight to the left of Nixon. I want all of you to know that we didn't make up the plaque in advance. It doesn't say what team, and I'm taking it back to Washington, put in Texas. <laughs> With the national title won, Texas needed to beat Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl to cap a perfect season and a perfect career for its quarterback. With Texas trailing by three with less than seven minutes to play, Street engineered a 17-play, 76-yard drive. With one minute and eight seconds left, Texas scored, going ahead for good, 21-17. to James Street's final game as starter had finished like the 19 before with wins. He finished his Texas career 20-0 as a starting quarterback. James Street was neither a great runner nor a great passer. He would tell you himself that he wasn't the greatest athlete on either the football or the baseball team, but he was among the greatest winners we ever had. And winning was not confined to the gridiron. Street went 29-8 and as a starting pitcher for Texas baseball with a no-hitter and fittingly a perfect game. And he had a way of getting himself prepared for a ball game that was amazing. He had a flair for the dramatic. He could do things under pressure that you never thought he would be able to do. Three years, he took the baseball team to the College World Series. He won 20 straight games as a starter, and he won a national championship. They are the images that created a mythical quality around Texas in the 1960s. A coach who demanded the best and a quarterback who refused to let him down. Those images seem a little older today that past growing more distant because Texas has lost the man that never lost, the timeless James Street. His son is Houston Street, the dominant relief pitcher for the San Diego Padres. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And to honor James Street in closing, we're going to have the University of Texas Longhorn Band play the Eyes of Texas. Hey!